So I'll tell you a little bit about our author today. Yochi Drazen is the managing editor of foreign policy and a highly respected military journalist. He's covered the Iraq, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars for the Wall Street Journal and reported for more than 30 countries. His writing has appeared in The Atlantic, Washington Post, Smithsonian, Tablet, and The New Republic. And he appears regularly on TV and radio news programs uh, such as NPR's Diane Reem Show and uh, PBS's Washington Week with Gwen Eiffel. Mr. Drazen grew up in Chicago, attended college at, Penn, at the U University of Pennsylvania, uh, where he graduated magna cum laude in 1999, and he went to work immediately for the Wall Street Journal, where he continued to write for the next 11 years. He didn't spend all that time in New York or in Washington. In April 2003, Yochi arrived in Iraq uh, with the 4th Infantry Division, and then spent the next two years living in Baghdad as the journal's main Iraq correspondent. He made more than 12 lengthy trips to Iraq and Afghanistan, spending a total of almost four years on the ground in two countries, mostly in frontline combat embeds. And it's clear that the experience of war is the foundation of Mr. Drazen's insight into the personal stories of loss and pain the Invisible Front present. William Tecumseh Sherman said that war is hell, and it changes, that, that's the quote. I mean, it's a short and sweet, not sweet actually, point is that war changes men and women who experience it. And we know, as a neuroscientist, I know that that experience changes the brain as well. The cost of many who fight the war is high. Post-traumatic stress disorder, severe mental illness, stigma, and suicide are not easy to understand. And these, these conditions and illnesses affect families and communities as well, uh, as well, and they can be treated and prevented or made worse. Even for those who don't suffer from PTSD, suicide is a major public health concern. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, over 41,000 people die by suicide each year in the United States. It is the 10th leading cause of death overall. Suicide is tragic, but it's often preventable. And so knowing the risks, risk factors for suicide and who is at risk can help reduce the suicide rate. Many people have some risk factors, but do not attempt suicide. And it's important to remember that suicide is not the normal response to stress, but it is, however, a sign of extreme distress and, and not a harmless bid for attention. And that's partly what the Invisible Front is about. So please join me in welcoming our author, Yoki Drazen, to the Gaithersburg Book Festival. Hi, good afternoon, Mike. Thank you for that. Thank you all for deciding to shelter for a little bit under this tent in this beautiful blue sky happy day. I would take slight issue with the, no offense to Gaithersburg residents, my beloved Chicago, home of the first place Chicago Cubs, clearly the world's greatest city, but <laughs> we'll put Gaithersburg, we'll slot that in as a, as a, narrow, a narrow second. We'll go with that. <laughs> eh, narrowly. Um, but I wanted to talk to you a bit about the book and then take as many questions as we have time to talk through. The book is a story of family and a story of love and a story of war. And it's a story of how those three things intersect, sometimes for good, sometimes for the tragic. But it, it's a human story. And at the center of that story is a family, the Grams. And at the center of the family are Mark Graham, who retired as a two-star general, and his wife, Carol. And there are three children, who I'll talk about in a moment, Kevin, Jeff, and Melanie Graham. I met Mark and Carol in 2009 when Mark was in command of Fort Carson. Fort Carson is one of the biggest bases in the US military, and it's stunningly beautiful. It's ringed by the mountains of Colorado. It's really just utterly magnificent. But I went there for a very unpleasant reason, which was 2009 was the first year the military suicide rate eclipsed that of the civilian world. So for years, once the Afghan and Iraq war started, the military su suicide rate was increasing, but so was the civilian one. And so the military would say, this isn't our problem. There's, something, there's nothing unique to us. It's a national problem, which, which was true. But 2009 was the first year that a higher ratio of military service personnel killed themselves than in the civilian world. So that was the year they crossed. To, since then, the military rates continued to go higher and higher and higher. There was a hope, I think, that when the wars ended and people began to come home, those rates would begin to fall. They haven't. And I'll talk to that in a moment. So I went to Colorado for a simple reason. Mark Graham was in command of Fort Carson. 
When he arrived there, it had the highest suicide rate in the army. And he tried to turn Fort Carson into a laboratory for testing different ways of getting help to people who needed it, of making people feel comfortable seeking help so there was less of a stigma preventing them from raising their hand in the first place to say, help me, something has changed, help me. And for Mark, this wasn't just an abstract issue. For Mark, this was a very personal one for him and his wife, Carol. They had lost one of their sons to suicide. Then they lost their other son in Iraq. At the time that I met them, at the time they wrote the book, I didn't have children. I now have two. But even then, the idea of losing a child and even getting out of bed was hard to get my head around. The idea of losing two was just totally, completely unimaginable. I'd come to Fort Carson because I had friends from Iraq, from Afghanistan, military friends, who came back and would call me or email me or Facebook message me and say that they looked in the mirror and didn't recognize themselves, that they would look at their wives or their husbands and see fear or see that they looked different to those they loved, that they knew they had changed, they knew they had come back differently, and they were scared by it themselves. Some of them attempted suicide. In a couple of cases, they were successful, unfortunately, taking their own lives. They had come through the war physically intact, but they came back with something dark inside of them, something they couldn't get through and they couldn't get past. And I would walk sometimes the walls of the Pentagon, the hallways, and say, where should I go to see someone who's trying to fight this, to meet someone interesting, someone who's really trying to do something creative? And I kept hearing the name Mark Graham, Mark Graham, Mark Graham. And people would say, he's lost two sons, you should go meet him. And as a reporter, you don't often hear of generals who lose children. It's rare. You hear of a lot of generals whose children serve, a lot of military families, it's generational. But very rarely do you hear of a general who lost a son, let alone two, let alone one to suicide. So I flew to Fort Carson. Meeting them, you would never know if you met Mark and Carol, never in a million years that they had lost children. Mark is sort of almost out of central casting for general. He stands straight up. He doesn't blink. Super polite, but there's an, a brilliance and a level of articulateness to how he speaks and eloquence. And you could see why people would follow him. His wife, Carol, used to be a cheerleader in college. She's perky and has a Kentucky accent and is constantly smiling even now. So you just never know. And when I went to their house, there were pictures of this beautiful family they had had, what Carol would later describe to me as a Walt Disney family, the family on vacation, the family playing sports, the family in the different countries Mark had lived in. Over the course of his career, as you know, military families go from a base in the United States to a base in Germany to a base in Korea and then come back. And so I got to know them and we began to talk. And this is their story. Mark and Carol met in Kentucky. Mark thought that he would do a few years in the military as an ROTC cadet. They'd pay for his college. Maybe he'd make a little bit of money afterwards, and then he'd become a lawyer. 34 years later, he finally retired. And in the course of those 34 years, he had gone from being a lieutenant, highly regarded, to a captain, highly regarded, and up and up and up. Over the course of his career, he would lead the military evacuation of New Orleans after Katrina. So when we think back, we think back of the general with his cigar. When you speak to that general, he'll tell you Mark Graham was the one who actually ran the evacuation, and particularly the evacuation of the Superdome. Mark Graham did that himself. He ran that. He was someone who, at Fort Carson, would have success. At every level, the people he served with would say, this man is bound for stardom. He's bound to be a general. Carol was a teacher, a substitute teacher, and she followed him wherever he went. So when he went to a different base in the US, she moved with him, went to Korea and to Germany, and they tried to build a family bubble in which to raise their three children. Jeff was the oldest. Jeff, all he ever wanted to do was serve in the military. To him, being in the army was the highest possible honor, and he dreamed even as a little kid of leading people into combat. He would go to sleep in camouflage pajamas. He was the one who looked like his dad, sounded like his dad, and wanted to be his dad. Kevin, the middle brother, was taller and bigger and stronger physically, and he was conflicted about the military a little bit. He admired his father, he loved his father. They're proud to be a military family, but there was a gentleness to his soul. He wasn't a fighter. He was somebody who wanted to help. He was somebody who, when he learned about the Holocaust, was in his room for two days. He just couldn't fathom that level of cruelty and that level of callousness. And his parents would notice that he was extraordinarily close with Jeff as they grew up, but also that he would occasionally fall into these dark places where he would just be in a crowded room but not talk to anybody, or go disappear into the corner and sort of be there on his own before he came back out. At the time, they didn't think anything of it. They just thought this is a quiet child, and sometimes that's what quiet children do. And then there was his sister, Melanie, the youngest of the three. 
they would l- torment the hell out of their sister. They would lock her in the closet. They would put her in a laundry thing and shove it down the stairs. They would do the things that brothers do to their sister. I now have a son and a daughter. We'll see if my son does that to his sister, but it's the things that children do. But they were hyper protective of her. They could do what they wanted, but if someone else touched her, even accidentally playing football or just running around like kids do, they would face the wrath of Kevin and Jeff Graham. Kevin and Jeff both went to the University of Kentucky. They were close enough that they lived together, and later Melanie, when she went, lived with them too. The idea, to my mind, of wanting to live with your sister in a, in a dorm apartment is kind of hard to comprehend, but they lived together. Jeff was a year older. Jeff excelled at ROTC. He was the highest rated ROTC cadet the University of Kentucky had. He was the one who led their sort of drill formation, the guys who would come out and do the very fancy displays with guns and with flags. He was the one who saw the war coming and was not excited about war, but was excited about the chance to serve. Kevin wanted to be a military doctor. He was also doing ROTC, but not in the interest of fighting. He was in the interest of going to medical school, helping people, and then eventually being a civilian doctor. Melanie wanted to be a nurse. Those are the dreams that the three children had. Jeff and Kevin were extraordinarily close, and their, their sport was golf. Kevin was a little bit overweight. Jeff was short. And they would talk about how it didn't matter if you were short and fat because golf was the one, the one equalizer. And so they would play. Jeff finished and was commissioned as a lieutenant in the Army and was getting ready to deploy for the first time, first for training and then for Iraq. And he and his brother Kevin made plans to play golf. It was their thing. So Jeff went to the golf course and he waited for his brother and his brother didn't show up. He called his brother's cell phone and no one picked up on his cell phone. Kept calling, kept leaving messages, and no response, no answer. So he called Melanie, their sister, and said, can you go check in on Kevin? Maybe he overslept, maybe he's, he forgot where he's supposed to play. So Melanie went to Kevin's room, and she knocked on the door, and there was no response. And she knocked on the door again, and there was no response. And when she opened the door, she found him hanging from a ceiling fan. Kevin had taken his own life. In retrospect, the family would look back and think that there were clues they had missed. And that's one of the things that will haunt Mark and Carol for the rest of their lives. They would look back to the times as a child when he would disappear into a room or into a corner. They would look back at times where he was just weirdly quiet at moments that they didn't expect it. After the fact, they found a little to-do list in his wallet. And in the to-do list were the kind of things you would see for any college student, pick up laundry, buy some books, whatever. And then the last thing was take toaster oven into bathtub but they didn't see it coming. They were devastated. They did not see it coming. In the immediate aftermath, Mark thought, I I can't serve anymore. If I hadn't served, maybe Kevin wouldn't have absorbed the idea of the military. Maybe he'd still be alive. Carol thought, we can't do this. We can't pull through this. They stabilized themselves. They decided they would try to to continue to stay in, and they did. Flash forward. Jeff, by this point, the Iraq War is 2003, heading into 2004. The Iraq war is in full swing. The invasion has ended. The civil war and the occupation have begun. And Jeff is getting ready to go, getting ready to deploy. And Mark says to him, Jeff, I can make a phone call. And with one phone call, you don't have to go fight. You don't need to. Your brother's already died. You don't need to go. And Jeff said, but dad, this is my dream. My men need me. And Mark said, you don't have any men. He hadn't commanded anything. But to Jeff, there were men there. There was a unit there that he was going to be in command of, and he wanted to go. And Mark thought, and this will haunt him as well. How could I possibly deny my son his dream? My son's dream was to serve. My son's dream was to do what he saw as honorable and go to war. I can't stop it. So Jeff Graham went to Iraq. Jeff Graham went to Fallujah. Fallujah then, like now, is a name that has resonance to people who follow the news because it is a bloody, bloody part of Iraq. In a random issue, I had been to Fallujah repeatedly, including into the place where Jeff's unit served. My wife had been to Fallujah. We met indirectly because of Fallujah, it's a place that has a lot of significance for me on a personal and professional level. So Jeff got to Iraq, he got to Fallujah, and he was a lieutenant, he was short. His men called him the Oompa Loompa, because he was really short. Most lieutenants would not like or accept having the enlisted guys that they were in command of make fun of him. Jeff didn't mind. He saw that as a way of kind of bonding with the guys that he would be spending the rest of his year in Iraq with. And one day, he and his unit were told to do a foot patrol. They were told to go through the town the base was in, cross a bridge, check out the other side of the bridge, cross the bridge again, and go back to the base. Routine. The kind of thing they had done dozens of times before, 
the kind of thing the unit would do dozens of times after. So they woke up early. They left the base. Nothing on the initial part of the patrol. They got to the bridge. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. So they began to cross the bridge. Jeff led from the front. So he was walking with a radio man for the unit and with an Iraqi translator. And as he was walking, he saw something, a piece of metal that he thought was metal, glisten in the dirt. It wasn't very big, but something about it made him pause. Something about it in his brain made him think there's something dangerous here. So he turned, and he told the men behind him to stay back. And just as he did, what he saw exploded. What he saw was a buried bomb. It was an IED. Jeff died. The other American soldier with him died. The Iraqi translator died. But the rest of the unit survived without a scratch. Jeff died a hero. For Mark and Carol, Mark was in the horrible position of finding out about Jeff's death before the military could officially, formally notify his wife. So for a full day, he knew and he couldn't tell her. He had to pretend that nothing was up, even though he knew what had happened to his son. What was extraordinarily painful for them amid the, the horror of losing their younger son and then the older son was the different ways they were treated. Kevin, it was a religious family, part of the family said he doesn't deserve to be given a service in a church. He doesn't deserve to be buried in, in any kind of cemetery, let alone a Christian one. He sinned by taking his own life. To them, that sounded like an obscenity. Their son was dead, and the idea that he was also a sinner of some sort, they just found unfathomable. When Jeff died, it was very different. The Kentucky legislature passed a resolution in his honor. He was the first native of Kentucky to die in the war. Flags flew at half-staff. Thousands of people turned out to line the road to the cemetery. It was a full military funeral. They fired the guns. There was a folded flag. And Mark and Carol would always remember that, that people would say to them, we're so sorry about your son, singular, that people would pretend that Kevin had never been there, that because Kevin had killed himself, there was a shame attached to his life and to his death that made it easier just not to discuss. Whereas Jeff, people know about heroism. People know about what it's like to lose brave people at war. And people want to talk about that, but never about Kevin. When they lost Jeff, Mark decided he had to retire. He thought there was no way that he could put on the uniform of a military that, in his mind, had taken both of his sons. He blamed himself. He looked back at that conversation with Jeff and said, you know what? It didn't matter what Jeff told me. I should have made that phone call. Jeff wouldn't have deployed. He'd still be here. Carol was haunted by it. They were both haunted by it. They both felt they could not stay in this world. One morning, Mark had filled out his paperwork to retire. He was ready to go. Carol had been up all night reading the Bible and reading a book of devotionals and said to Mark, in a phrase that stuck with me even now, she said, this can be a chapter in our lives, or this can be the end. This can be our life, and it stops here. And they found the strength to continue to stay in. Mark was promoted up. He was promoted up again. And there he was, now a two-star general in command of Fort Carson. When he got to Fort Carson, Fort Carson didn't simply have the highest suicide rate in the country. It also, right before he got there, it had the biggest murder spree ever carried out by U.S. soldiers in a single place, in the whole long history of the U.S. military. There was a unit whose battle nickname, unfortunately, was the Lethal Warriors. When they came from, back from Iraq, 11 members of that unit murdered 12 people, some soldiers, some civilians. So Mark got to Fort Carson, and they were dealing with the aftermath of a murder spree, and they were dealing with the aftermath of a suicide rate that was going higher and higher and higher. Mark, to Gim, again, this wasn't abstract. This wasn't simply an issue of military readiness or other kind of vaguer terms. This was personal. The first thing he did when he got there was summon all the officers to a convention center and start talking about his family. And when he did, when he started talking about Kevin and about Jeff, he started to cry. And some of the people in the audience who I spoke to later for the book were of the opinion of, what the hell? Why, this is a general? This is the guy commanding us at a time of war and he's up there crying? How is this the person that our people are supposed to follow? But then for a lot of them, it clicked that this was exactly the kind of general you needed during exactly this kind of war when the casualties weren't simply physical, but they were psychological and they were emotional. Mark Graham, at the time that I went to go meet him, turned the base into a, lab into a laboratory for testing different ways of trying to get help to people. There were two things he did in particular that were later copied across the army. One, the military had a hotline that was of literally no use. So you would call this number and say, I need help, and it would go kind of like if you're calling to register, press one for this, press two for this, press three for that, and in the end you wouldn't end up talking to anybody. Mark changed it so that when you called, the call went first to his assistant and then to him. 
So I spoke to a woman whose son had been at Fort Carson, and she called this number thinking that he would, she would again get to the thing of press one for this or two for that, and was stunned to find herself on the phone with General Graham less than five minutes after she called. She called because her son had tried to commit suicide, and he scrawled a suicide note in paint onto his barracks wall. Thankfully, thankfully, he didn't. Friends got to him in time. He got the help he needed. He did not sign that type of, he did not carry out what he said he would do. But there was a callousness in the military at that, mo at that moment. There was a cruelty. So his commanders saw this suicide note on the wall, and they said, you know what? We're going to bring him up on charges for defacing government property. So his mother drove cross-country to Fort Carson and said, if I paint over the wall, if I paint it over, will you let my son go? They said, sure, sure. So she spent a Saturday, I mean, really think about that, painting over a suicide note that her son had scrawled in a moment of sheer desperation. She painted it over, and it was beautifully painted, and so they brought him up on charges anyway. That was what the military had in it at the time. Not every base, not every person, I'm not trying to generalize, but that was the feeling that many of the military had, that if you said you had PTSD, you were a coward. You just didn't want to go back and fight. You were scared. That if you said you needed help, you were weak, and you didn't deserve to wear the uniform. This is what Mark was confronting. He was confronting a military that didn't have the people, so there were long waiting lists to get help. They didn't fully comprehend what it was they were treating. They didn't comprehend the severity of the problem, the number of people who had PTSD, the number of people who were taking their own lives. And they didn't know how to get past this cruelty, how to get past this idea that PTSD was fake. There was a case I wrote about in the book where a soldier who had a perfect record, perfect, came back from deployment from Iraq basically broken. He got fat, he didn't shave, didn't show up at formation, and so his commanding officer court-martialed him. Mark reached down as a general, which he could do, and reversed the court-martial and said, this guy's got PTSD. Had him transferred to Walter Reed, he got a diagnosis of severe PTSD. It's very rare in the military for a general to reach down and reverse what a, another officer had done. Mark was not popular, as you might imagine, for having done this. I interviewed the colonel in question for the book, and he said, General is my boss, but, he, but I think he was wrong. Even now, even though the soldier did have PTSD, he still thinks Mark was wrong to have done it. But Mark did it. And by the time he left Fort Carson, Fort Carson, which had the highest suicide rate when he got there in the military, had one of the lowest. Now, I'd like to end the book there, and I wish it did end there. I wish that I could say that the good ideas he had, one of which was the hotline, another of which was assigning every unit a doctor, so that that doctor would see the people before they left, see them while they were there, see them when they got back. The thought being, a soldier who came back who was meeting, let's say, Mike for the first time, maybe wouldn't feel comfortable talking. Maybe wouldn't feel comfortable letting down their guard. But if it was a doctor they had a relationship with, they'd, be, they'd feel comfortable talking. And the doctor, if they knew them, might see cues that weren't being verbalized. They might see a physical change. They might see something that let them know this person needed help. That was replicated army-wide, that program. A lot of the other stuff Mark did was undone within less than two years of him leaving. Fort Carson, again, has a high suicide rate. The Army's suicide rate continues to remain high. Where it's highest now is among the National Guard and the Army Reserve. Because if you're active duty, you come back. The system may not be perfect, but there's a system. You come back to a military base. You come back to other families who know what you've gone through, what your spouses have gone through. But if you're in the Army National Guard, you might come back to a town where nobody else has served. None of your neighbors, none of your friends. If you're in the Army Reserve, similarly, no one at your office probably served. We living in Washington, we see soldiers more than most cities. But in Chicago, I don't know a single person from growing up, not one, who served. Philadelphia, where I went to school, I had two friends in ROTC, but otherwise, not a single person. When I went to interview Melanie Graham for the book, she called me when I was on the train to say, I'm going to be a bit of a mess when you get here. I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. I'll tell you when you get here. And so I met up at her apartment. Melanie is a nurse. She's a very fashionable woman. If you saw her on the Upper East Side of New York where she lives, you'd never, never guess what she had suffered through. But I went to her apartment, and she came to the door, and she was sobbing. This was 2014. And she was sobbing because the best man at their wedding, who had been in the Special Forces, had just died in Afghanistan. And they just found out, she and her husband, that day. And I was thinking as we were walking through the Upper East Side of New York, we probably passed hundreds of people, maybe thousands. I'd be surprised if more than five of those people 
had ever known anybody who served. I'd be surprised if many of those people gave any thought to the war. I'd be surprised if some of those people knew the war was still going. They're so forgotten by us as a country. And that's all I could think of as we were walking. Here was a woman whose life had just been shattered again by a war that most people didn't know was going on or didn't give much thought to. But for Melanie, that was the reality. And for Mark and Carol, that's the reality. And I'll close with this. Mark and Carol, by this point, have become family. When my wife found out that she was pregnant, the first call beyond to our parents was to them. When we had a son, the first gift basket that arrived, which was full of University of Kentucky stuff because they're rabid Wildcats fans, was from them. We just had a daughter. Again, the first big thing that came was from them. They're extraordinarily people. There's no journalistic objectivity when I, when I think of Mark and Carol. And when, when we worked on the book together, they, it was my book, they had no veto power, but they saw the manuscript. And I said to them, if there were things that they had real problems with, we could talk through. Carol said, you know, people are going to read this book and think that I'm the worst parent on earth because my son called for help and I didn't hear him. I don't think that Carol's the worst parent on earth. I think Carol's heroic because she tells the story of what happened to me and in this book in extraordinary detail. And it was difficult as a journalist because I would have to ask them to relive again and again and with, to really try to probe to get the details. The book is written a, a, like a novel. It's not written sort of person X said this, person Y said that. It's novelistic which meant I had to have them give me scenery of what they were wearing and what was being said and the surroundings, which meant pushing them again and again for these details, and I felt terrible, but I had to do it for the book. And of all the things in the book that were painful for the family, things about drinking, about drug use, the only thing they wanted to change was something they thought would make Jeff's fiance look bad. That was it. No other changes. They are extraordinary people. The book is their story. The book is a story of a military at war, of a war that as we know from what we're seeing in Iraq, is still going, a war that may not end anytime soon. And it's a story of what happens, again, when a military and a war and a family intersect. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So the question was about a statistic that roughly 22 veterans a day take their own life. Um, that statistic is a little bit squishy when you talk to people who are both in the military and in, in the field of mental health, in part because it's hard to know when a person takes their own life what the cause was, right? So let's say you have a veteran who served in Vietnam or in Korea who lost their job and couldn't find another job and began to spiral down and took their own life. They were a veteran. They did serve in the military but that probably wasn't the cause. So the number is correct, but the cause is hard to bring out of it. You know, Mike mentioned this at the outset. Since the invention of the car, the thing that killed the most people beyond illness were car crashes. And we see on the news, local news loves car crashes. That's what they live on. The thing that kills more people now than car crashes is suicide. And within suicide, the biggest place where you're seeing a number jump is men from 55 to 65, white men. And the theory is that it's economic, that they've lost their jobs or they have a crappy job and they feel like they won't earn what they used to earn, probably accurately, and so they give up. So some of those people may have served, let's say, in Vietnam or Korea. They may now take their own life, but it probably isn't because of PTSD. It's probably because of something else. The, the one flip side, though, the one part I, would, I do want to mention on PTSD, PTSD doesn't really go away. When I came back from Iraq, I was diagnosed with it. I still have it, I think, now. When I got back... I had moments where I was suicidal. I had moments where I would hear a loud noise and jump under a table, where I would have nightmares that were so vivid that they felt totally, totally and completely real. And it took me a while to accept that I needed help. It took me several years. And military guys, it's the same thing. It's a process of deciding you need it and being willing to seek it. But I mention that because PTSD could be there kind of lying dormant for years, decades, and then suddenly 30 years from now, something could trigger it and it could explode. And that's, when we think about the toll of this war, we have to remember that, that these invisible wounds don't heal. You can make them better, you can try to give a person help, you can get them away from an emergency place, but they're always there, they're always just simmering. Sure, so the, the question is what the military does now uh, for veterans who need help or, or who, are, who are suicidal. The military is like a giant ship 
So it takes it forever to turn, but when it turns, it really turns. So for a long time, there was an issue in the press, accurately reported, that there wasn't enough money devoted towards mental health, which was true for years and years and years. But then again, this giant ship turns, and now there's enormous amounts of money being spent by the military. So much, actually, that they can't hire enough doctors, not because the money is there, but because they just can't find enough doctors to fill the slots. So they're spending money on treatment. They're spending money on research. But the biggest thing that they're tr trying to do, and frankly failing, at least up until now, is cultural. They're trying to get people to fully internalize and accept that PTSD is a real thing, and to fully accept that if they're an enlisted guy, and the guy next to them who they've known says to them at a bar, you know, I can't do this anymore, that that soldier will get his friend help. That if they're an, it's an officer who hears a younger guy or a younger woman in their unit say something that scares that officer, that that officer will get them to seek help. It hasn't changed yet enough as, it, as much as it should. There's one thing that the military could do, one thing that would change that significantly overnight, and it won't do it. What needs to happen is generals, generals need to say, I have PTSD. I served in Iraq. I came back with PTSD. My career didn't end. People didn't see me as a coward. You can get through this. This will not end your career. Over the course of the book, I spoke to about a dozen generals who admitted that they had some form of PTSD. And I said to them, let me tell your story. Let me tell your story under your name, because it'll carry weight. And of those 12, one, let me use his name. The other 11 wouldn't, even now. Until that changes, until generals are comfortable saying, at the very top, to the people at the very bottom, you can get through this without shame, the culture won't change. Please. So for a long time, the feeling had been, and it makes sense to all of us, I think, intuitively looking at it from the civilian world, that multiple deployments was the issue. That when someone goes to Iraq or Afghanistan again and again and again, you, know, you meet people now who have gone five times, six times. That that was the change. That people in Vietnam would go and serve. It would be horrible, and they would come back, and that'd be it. And in Iraq and Afghanistan, the wars still continue. Guys still go again and again and again. I met someone in Afghanistan once who's in the special forces where the deployments are more frequent but shorter. It was his ninth deployment. And what would happen is he would go home for three months and then get called away again. Then he'd come home but know that he would have to go back again. And he told me that sometimes he wouldn't even see his kids because he knew that it would just tear them apart because they'd say, Daddy's home. And he would know that he, Daddy would be leaving again in a month and he didn't want to put them through it. So he would meet his wife someplace. They'd have a few days together and that would be it. But the more the military researched it, they found that that intuitive thing is actually not true that most of the people in the military who committed suicide did not actually deploy even once. And so the counterintuitive feeling was correct, and the intuitive part was incorrect. What they found, the biggest trigger, and this to your question about what's different, they found that people who came to the military with pre-existing propensities for drinking or drug use or depression, they were the ones who killed themselves whether or not they had deployed. And what's different now, I think, than the past is at various points the military during the war was desperate for people. They just didn't have enough guys to go fight. So they lowered the standards significantly. It used to be that if you were out of shape, you couldn't join the military. If you had a criminal record, you couldn't join the military. If you didn't graduate high school, you couldn't join the military. But at the height of the war, all those things fell away because they needed people. So what changed is those people who wouldn't have been able to make it in, made it in. And some of those people, even though they didn't go fight, those are the people who later took their lives. So we all live in the D.C. area. Probably a lot of you know that typically when you're a retired general, you retire and you cash out. You join a defense contractor and your salary increases tenfold and, and that's your life. Mark is now running a military suicide prevention center in New Jersey where what they've done is hire counselors who are only veterans. The feeling is if someone calls and the phone is picked up by another veteran, it's an easier conversation. So instead of cashing out, Mark runs that program in New Jersey. It's based at Rutgers. Carol serves on the board of suicide prevention, different bodies across the country. And I've gotten to know them over the years, and I've seen them talk about their kids publicly, which is what they do. They travel the country, and they speak to big groups again and again and again. And whenever I see them speak, they cry. And it never goes away. There's not like this phrase, closure, a word that I personally find obscene, the idea that, you know, you could lose children, but it'll be okay. 
It's not okay. They still cry when they tell the story, but they tell the story and they're feeling this will hopefully not sound cliche because it's not. Their feeling is if they speak to 30 people or 40 people or 50 people or 10 people and there's one person in the room who was thinking of getting help but thought if they do, they were weak and that one person gets help because Mark and Carol relived this pain, shared this pain, that for them it's worth it. Melanie is married. Uh, she married a special forces veteran who lost his brother on 9-11. So they have a shared sense of loss. He's the funniest man I've ever met. Again, he comes from a loud Catholic Irish family from Queens. Never would you guess that he had lost a brother. And Melanie's pregnant, expecting their first child, Mark and Carol's first grandchild, in two months. Please. It's a spectacular question. The question was, if there's something inherent to serving that requires, in some cases, some of the things that might now, when you're trying to change them, perhaps make people less effective when they serve. Yes, I think there are some things. Not many of them, but hypervigilance, which is a hallmark of PTSD, when you serve is absolutely critical. You have to be listening for everything you, see, you hear, and you have to be always looking for something suspicious on the ground. You do need that. The problem is when you come back, how do you turn it off? Being able to be hyper-decisive to, if you're in command, say, guys, we're going that way. And that road is blocked, and you tell guys, we're going that way. It's great, but how do you turn that off when you come home? So there are things that are valuable, but also dangerous when you come back, but nothing that can't be treated. Nothing where you can't be taught to deal with it when you come home. You know, to the question before about what's different, think back to World War II. I interviewed people for the book who were World War II veterans. So they would finish their service, then they'd get on a ship, and then the ship would come home. And they'd have a month or two months on that ship, and there'd be that two-month period or one-month period to decompress. And the time that they were overseas, they'd write a letter, and it would take a month to get to the U.S., and their wife would write a letter back, and it would take a month to get to them. Now think about these guys. These guys, they finish. They go Iraq to Kuwait, Kuwait to the U.S., and it takes a day. There is no decompression. While they're there, they're talking to their wives or husbands by Skype every day if they want to. It's constant communication. So this idea of distance, which can actually be very healthy between their military life and their civilian life, there isn't any. And that, to my mind, the biggest single change between the past and now, the biggest by far, is that. That when you, when you go now, you can't decompress. You just go straight from one world to the other without anything to pass through to give you a bit of time. I missed the second part. I'm sorry. It was loud. So the question is, uh, are most military suicides not because of deployments, but because of quality of, of people that went in? Um, most of the suicides are people who had not deployed. So that, yes, to the first part of it. Um, quality of people is... I know you probably didn't mean it this way, and, and it's so it's if I if it was expressed in a way that implied a quality issue, it's not how I meant it. It's people who had problems that may not have been diagnosed because the focus was not weeding people out, the focus was bringing people in at all costs. So there are people who had issues that would have kept them out who were allowed in. Many of those people are the people who did take their own lives. But of the people who committed suicide, many were alcoholic. The alcoholism was something that didn't have anything to do with when they joined the military, it, it, they may not have come in at a time when the military was most desperate, but they had a propensity for drinking. And that propensity for drinking is what, in some way, contributed to or was linked to their suicide. The majority were people who had drug and alcohol problems. And the vast majority of military suicides are male. The vast majority are handgun. One quick kind of statistic that, that I found interesting, the place where you're seeing the biggest increase is like almost like this, is among female veterans. And the numbers, the raw numbers are very, very small, but the percentage increase is very, very high because of the epidemic of military rape and military sexual assault. So mostly male as a problem, but where you're seeing the increases, percentage increase is among female veterans, female troops. Yes.
Yeah, the, the question was about how capacity of, of service, the things that you did overseas, might have impacted when you came back. And, and I think that's true. I think that's true for the people who serve now as well, that people who serve in frontline combat do tend to come back for reasons that would be intuitive and accurate with PTSD more than those who don't. That said, this is a war, and I've spent a lot of time covering it, a lot of time living in both places, where there is usually not a fixed front line. So you could be at a big base, a big base that has a pizza hut, as was actually the case, and Starbucks equivalent called uh, the Green Bean, places that had restaurants that delivered, and there, that base where you could be gaining weight because there was so much food that you would never leave, that base could be rocketed. And somebody might die all the same, and you might come back with PTSD all the same, even though you'd never left, even though you'd never actually picked up a gun and gone to fight. And that, I think, is part of the nature of this war, that it didn't have a fixed front line the way that World War II did, Korea did, Vietnam did. So the question was about PTSD when you're a journalist or a civilian as compared to those in the military. You know, for me, I got back in 2007 from living in Iraq pretty much continuously, and I knew that I was different. I had flashes of temper that would actually scare me. Like, I'd get a bad table at a restaurant and want to just punch the maitre d', or I'd play basketball a lot. Somebody would bump me, and I'd want to just choke him. And I knew that there was something at issue, it took two years until I realized I needed to get help. Two years to accept that I need a medication, which I have no shame in admitting, which I take to this day and may take forever. And in those two years, there are moments where I thought about killing myself. And the Wall Street Journal where I worked was extraordinarily generous financially. But no one at the Wall Street Journal, among the editors of the journal, and this is not to put down the editors, they'd never covered the war. They'd never been to Iraq or to Afghanistan. So they didn't have any way of understanding it at all. For them, it was totally alien. So we couldn't even have a conversation about it because if I said, yeah, I saw some horrible things, they weren't dismissive of it, but they couldn't imagine what it was that I had seen, what it was I had gone through. You know, there were times where I'd be on a foot patrol and a person next to me, a, a soldier, would get killed 10 feet away. Or there'd be a suicide bombing in Baghdad that I'd cover and there'd be, you know, bodies strewn everywhere that I, I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but these things don't go away. I mean, you see them and you come back and you're different. I did a magazine profile of a Medal of Honor winner, and when he talks to crowds, he says to them, if you go to war and you come back changed, that's a good thing. That's healthy. But if you come back and you're the same, then you're sick. Then you need help, because you should change. You shouldn't be able to do or see horrible things and come back with no difference in who you are and how you see the world. And there was a difference for me in how I, in how I came back. What was ultimately for me the most supportive, and this is, I think, true for a lot of people in the military, the universe of reporters who cover wars is actually pretty small, and we see the same people in the same crappy places again and again and again. So when Al-Qaeda conquered northern Mali, I went to cover it for the Atlantic and saw reporters I'd seen in Iraq or in Lebanon or in Afghanistan. And there was an email group, as you might imagine, to talk about logistics, you know, is country X safe, can you trust translator Y? But then people on those listservs would begin to mention kind of quietly, any of you guys having nightmares? You know, any of you guys drinking more than you used to? Anybody having problems in their marriage? And that became hugely supportive, knowing that it wasn't me as, a, me as a journalist being weak. It was me as a journalist being one of a community who were suffering the same thing. And that was of enormous value. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so the question is about charities that are doing good work, charities that, that really help. There are two that I would highlight um, that are both extraordinary groups. One is called TAPS. It's, it's an acronym. TAPS is for the surviving children of people who die in the military. And what's interesting about them is that they don't make any differentiation between how a person dies. So if your mom is killed in combat or your dad commits suicide, it doesn't matter. They run summer camps. They do absolutely extraordinarily beautiful things. The uh, Army 10-Miler, which is coming up, um, I'm running it. I wear four taps with the names of people who died on the front and on the back. They're a great group. 
The other I would flag is called Given Hour, which is founded by a woman in Bethesda. Given Hour, what it does is it finds civilian psychologists and psychiatrists across the country who volunteer to give an hour of their time once a week to a veteran or to their family. And what that's done is in towns and cities all over the country where there's no military resource, nothing, a veteran who needs help has a place to go. They're a lean organization. It's run out of her house. The money that you give to both places, it goes to people to help. It doesn't get lost in other, in other fundraising or other expenses. Give an hour and taps are the two that I would recommend.